Welcome everyone to the January 28th, 2023 edition of the online viewing session from the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. It is a pleasure to have you all here with us this evening and I hope everyone can hear me. Do I have the correct microphone setting, I hope? Great, okay, sounds like everyone can hear me. So I wasn't sure uh, which uh, button I had activated here. So it is fantastic to have you all here with us this evening. So allow me to uh, unshare so everyone can see me. Hello, here I am, this is me here. And uh, so my name is Richard Bell. I am the president of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society and your host for this evening. And I wanted to start off with kind of an apology uh, for the late start to the uh, current season of online viewing sessions. Uh, so those of you that are members are probably pretty much caught up of, of why we had such a late start this season. But let me just kind of recap. Uh, for those of you that don't know or you're joining us for the first time, we normally start in November and go through February. And the reason we couldn't start in November this year is because there was an issue with the roll-off roof that the telescope is located in. And Mike Patton, who owns the observatory, was not going to return for the current season until mid-November. So the good news is the roof was fixed really easy. It was just a small bushing that had to be replaced. And we probably could have pulled off a online viewing session that month, but it would have been kind of a knuckle dragger to get ready on time. And plus we didn't really plan anything out well in advance. And so hardly anyone would have known about it. So uh, we started in November or, or December this year. And then we had uh, uh, some other problems. The, the absolute main problem was with the telescope itself, specifically the mount, the Paramount ME2 German Equatorial Mount that basically drives everything is the uh, US, the micro USB connection that allows us to connect from the computer to the telescope basically came loose off the circuit board. And um, we contacted Software Bisque, the folks that make them out, and they basically said, absolutely not. We're not going to try to fix the thing. You're just going to have to buy a new one for $1,500. And we're like, you uh, know, yeah, okay. And uh, so we, we were going to place an order, but they also told us because of the chip shortage that everyone's uh, having issues with, it, it would be a very long wait time to get our new circuit board. They weren't selling any new mounts because of this. And again, we couldn't even really order a circuit board. So it would have been a long time to wait for one. There's no way we would have been here with you tonight if we decided to just try to get a new circuit board. So we had a great idea, at least I had a great idea, along with my co-host here, Kevin Jung. Why don't we contact uh, a friend of ours and a KS member named Jeff Dickerman? Jeff Dickerman is a, is a KS member and owns Optech. Uh, you may know they sell uh, flat field devices. We have two of their products. We had the flip flat for the Takahashi to do flat fields and we had the big flat screen for the plane wave. Uh, so we are a Optech customer and, um, and we contacted him. He basically said, absolutely, I'll take a look at it. So we sent, sh shipped it to him. And not only did they fix the USB uh, port, but they realized there was a blown capacitor, which we didn't even know about. So they replaced that as well. And they shipped it back uh, with just a small uh, fee for basically parts and labor. And everything's working fine uh, with regards to the Paramount. But the really good news is kind of the silver lining, if you want to call it that, is even though the mount's been down for uh, the December session and the first session we were going to do in January, the weather was terrible out there. Uh, so even if the mount and everything was working flawlessly because of the rotten weather they've been having out west with all the rain and stuff like that, uh, we would have had to cancel anyway. So up until this season, we've never experienced a cancellation 
but now we've had two of them from back to back. So uh, it's good to be here tonight. Tonight is actually our, our bonus session, our second session we were going to do in January to make up for not having one in November. But it turns out the way between the mount and the weather, this is our first session of the year. So that's why we're basically only going to have two sessions this season. But maybe if we can, we'll throw in some other bonus sessions. We'll just have to see how it goes. So again, I'm very, very pleased that uh, we currently have roughly 74 people joining us on uh, Zoom and uh, a handful on YouTube, at least a few on YouTube. So I guess the YouTube folks just don't like Zoom, but we prefer everyone join us on Zoom. And we hope uh, many of you uh, interact with us throughout the evening because it makes it a lot more fun. So let's go ahead and begin. Let me go back to my uh, PowerPoint here and just give you a very quick intro. I'm, I'm not going to do the full intro that I usually do during the first session, but uh, here is where the telescope is located. In fact, um, let me turn on my uh, laser pointer. Here it is. Here's the telescope right here. Of course, you'll get a better look at it later. And it's located in this 20 by 20 roll-off roof observatory named Piishi Observatory, which is uh, Apache for Nighthawk, as I recall. But Mike can correct me if I'm wrong later. And again, it's a 20 by 20 roll-off roof observatory. Uh, Mike has three other telescopes in there, and we have our remote telescope uh, there as well. And you can see uh, back here is the weather station. And we'll show you the weather here shortly. And you can see this little thing right here. There's like a little structure here, a little structure there. You'll see the other structure here. And the, the kind of rectangular thing here is our S-Big All-Sky uh, 340C color camera, which basically shows us the current sky above Arizona Sky Village, where the observatory is located in southeastern Arizona. And it also allows us to check the weather. So, man, that sounds like a good idea. So let's go ahead and switch over to the All-Sky camera and see how the weather is doing. So uh, a couple things we normally don't have here on the All-Sky camera during online viewing sessions. The, the main thing, of course, is this nasty thing right here. Oh, just look at it. It's horrid. This is the moon. Uh, I do believe today is first quarter moon. And we never usually have the moon in the sky during an online viewing session. We try to plan these as close to uh, like new moon or last quarter as we can. But remember, this is supposed to be the bonus session, the, the second session in January we kind of threw in to make up for not having one in November. Little did we know this would turn out to be the first session of the year. And cross your fingers, hopefully it's not the only online viewing session of the year. Hopefully the weather won't deteriorate again or the equipment won't break down and uh, skunk us out. But here's the other structure is this bird perch here. I don't know why we have the perch all to one side like this, uh, but this is to keep uh, birds off the dome here to the all sky camera and it's worked like a charm. We haven't had the bird, bird dropping issue that we had on a routine basis for many, many, many months or even a couple of years. So it's difficult to give a tour of the constellations because we have this monstrosity in the way and we're gonna work our way around it as best we can tonight. But clearly uh, kind of to the lower left of the moon, you can see uh, the most dominant and most probably famous constellation in the sky, Orion the Hunter. You can make out three stars in a row, two above and two below. And of course, the three stars in a row are is his belt. The two stars above are his shoulders. There's a little group of stars right here for his little head. He has like this teeny tiny head and these broad shoulders. Oh, you can see we just updated. And then we have the two stars below showing his legs. And the stars at the corners are Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Safe. And of course, we have the three belt star stars here on the tech, on the limb, and Mentaka on the end. And hanging from the belt is this famous sword. You can't really see the shield tonight. And you can kind of barely make out uh, the club he's holding up with his uh, armpit Beetlejuice here. In fact, Beetlejuice means armpit of the great one. 
And because this is a red supergiant, it's like a big red boil in his armpit. I know, that's disgusting. And we can go uh, kind of up and to the right. And I think right about there, it's little, a little hard to tell, obviously, is Aldebaran with Mars nearby. And of course, in this region, we have the Hyades and Taurus the bull, but uh, the overexposed moon really washes out Taurus there. But next, we can go up from uh, Aldebaran to Capella, which is in the constellation Auriga the Charioteer. It, it basically looks like this kind of house-shaped constellation here. Then we go over to Castor and Pollux, the Gemini twins. And I'll just kind of point out the, the general rectangular view of the constellation. If you look really closely, you can make out two stick figures of people. But again, it's a little washed out tonight. So again, Castor and Pollux. Then we go down to Procyon and Canis Minor, which is just one other star. And then we have the brightest star in the nighttime sky, Sirius, in the constellation Canis Major, the, the big dog. And you can see the dog rising here. His tail is just above this feature here, and you can see we have them everywhere, and that's clouds. Uh, the majority of the cloud cover in southeast Arizona is actually further southeast, but we're catching just like little bits of clouds that's causing all this. It's been slowly dissipating, but uh, hopefully it'll improve and won't we'll kind of spoil our view of any of the objects. And we have um, Polaris up here. Uh, you can't quite make out the Big Dipper too well yet, but around this area over here, we have a comet right now, which we hope to look at a little bit later. And I believe over here, you might be wondering what this bright thing is over here. That is Jupiter. So that is our tour of the uh, currently uh, visible stars and constellations and moon and planets above Arizona Sky Village. All right, so now we're back to our PowerPoint slide here. And we're gonna start as always, well, not always, but normally with our Takahashi FSQ 106 EDX3, which basically rides piggyback on the larger telescope that we'll use later. So I'm not gonna go through all the spe specifications here in detail, but basically it, it's a, a, a four inch plus refractor with just a 530 millimeter focal length. And um, this is an outdated picture because the Takahashi no longer looks exactly like this. We still have this thing here. This is called the flip flat, which is what we got from Optech. And this is basically a motorized uh, a dust cover, but it also allows us to conduct flat fields for uh, proper image calibration. But uh, because of the uh, uh, heavy weight of our uh, camera and filter wheel here, we had to replace the focuser. So just recently, uh, KAS member Jim Kurtz, who also has a house out there now, uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society members are taking over, Arizona Sky Village is we installed a uh, new focuser onto the Takahashi. And that's called a Moonlight Nighthawk 2 uh, focuser. It's an extremely precise focuser and is capable of holding up to 25 pounds. And our setup here with the filter wheel and camera, that weighs about uh, 11 or 12 pounds. So uh, the new Nightcrawler, which is a major upgrade uh, to our setup, um, will help uh, alleviate the problem. We're still having tilt issues with the camera and telescope. We worked on that for, oh geez, like three hours this past Thursday, and we haven't quite got it right yet, but the images still look pretty darn good. Now, I know you can't quite see the Nighthawk too well in these pictures, so here's a quick shot of it from the manufacturer's uh, website, Moonlight Instruments, and it is, again, a very, very excellent focuser. The camera that we'll be using is kind of getting old by today's standards, but it is still an excellent camera because CCDs or charge coupled devices like this one are kind of on their way out. Uh, they're being replaced with CMOS cameras or compl complementary metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, 
So this is our SBIG STX16803 CCD camera, which is a full frame camera. It's nearly a 37 millimeter square uh, chip with uh, roughly uh, 4,100 by 4,100 pixels, which is low by today's standards. But for astronomy, it's not really such a huge deal. And it, it does have roughly a 17 megapixel resolution, which again today is considered kind of low, but still for astronomy, it's pretty darn good. And we have two identical versions of this camera, which has caused problems over the years. Uh, but so we have one on the Takahashi and we have one on the plane wave that we'll use later. And uh, this camera attaches directly to a filter wheel, which contains seven filters. And we'll be using at least a couple of those tonight, mainly our clear luminance filter and probably our hydrogen alpha filter. So here's where we're going to start tonight with the Andromeda galaxy. I figured tonight with the Takahashi, we're just kind of going to end. We're getting off to such a late start. We're going to start with some of the classics. We're going to do the classics tonight with Takahashi. And these are objects we pretty much have to do every season because everybody will ask about them. So we're going to start with M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And we all know the Andromeda Galaxy, it's considered uh, the most distant object you can see with your unaided eye. It's not 100% true. M33, which is near M31, roughly in the sky, it's actually a little over 3 million light years away. And under very dark skies, you can see M33. But normally, we say M31 is kind of the most famous object you can see with just your eyes alone. That you know, doesn't lie in the Milky Way. There are many other galaxies that are, are, are closer. Uh, but Andromeda is the nearest big galaxy to the Milky Way at about two and a half million light years away. It was first noted as a small cloud in the Book of Fixed Stars by the Persian astronomer Ab al-Rahman al-Sufi in 964 AD. And the German astronomer Simon Marius was the first to describe M31 after observing it through a telescope for the first time in 1612. And Charles Messier, because the M in M31 stands for Messier, he included it in his catalog in 1764. Because, of course, Charles Messier included it in his catalog, so nobody would mistake it with a comet. But even in Charles Messier's time, M31 was fairly well known. And of course, as is quite well known, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, as seen in this wonderful sketch here, is due to collide with our own Milky Way in a little less than 4 billion years. So go ahead and set your calendar. So you can see I always start off with this kind of basic information slide with a sketch uh, as Andromeda looks through a telescope by an amateur astronomer. And I'm sure many of you have observed M31 many times. So it's actually fairly easy to find in the sky. The general trick is, is look for the great square, which I couldn't point out tonight because of the moon nearby. So we have the great square with three stars belonging to Pegasus, one belongs to Andromeda. And you just kind of follow from Alpha Rats, the, the head of Andromeda. You go to these two stars here, these two stars here, just kind of work your way up until you see a little glow, and that's where you'll find M31. It's uh, located, you know, just like a degree or so above Mu Andromedae here, so it's relatively nearby. It, even if you find these two stars in binoculars, you can star hop right to it. And of course, the Andromeda galaxy is the largest member of the local group of galaxies, which contains the Milky Way. At, at present, there are, there are roughly 55 known galaxies in a irregularly shaped volume, about one megaparsec in diameter. And of the bright galaxies, of those 55 of the bright galaxies, 14 are dwarf elliptical galaxies, three are spiral, or four if you count uh, the large Magellanic cloud here, which is which has spiral characteristics, and then uh, four are irregular. 
So there's your quick introduction to the Andromeda galaxy. Now, let me go back to the web browser here. And uh, we'll switch to ACP here. So this is called uh, the Astronomer's Control Panel. Specifically, this is the web interface to the Astronomer's Control Panel. It allows uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society members to access the remote telescope once you take the training and pay the fee. Um, so this allows us to control the telescope over the internet. So that way, uh, most people don't have direct access to the computer that controls the observatory because um, that might be fraught with uh, problems. So we're going to scroll down here. And you can see I already have M31 entered. So all I have to do is type M31. I'm pretty sure I hit get coordinates, but it wouldn't be the first time I forgot to do that. So I'm just going to do it again. And you can see, yep, sure, sure enough, we're, we're good to go here. And it looks up the right ascension declination. Basically, it's coordinates in the sky. We're going to do a five minute or 300 second exposure with the clear luminance filter. We don't need the focus. Uh, calibration is saved, so we don't need to do that. And we're just going to hit Acquire Image. And uh, what will happen here, let me see if I can uh, now go to, here we go. Now, this tends to freeze when I uh, don't have the browser open for a while. So I'm going to hit Reload. And we get the matrix view of our PEC camera. And pretty soon here, it should uh, slew off to the Andromeda galaxy, crossing our fingers. There she goes. So she's going to have to slew all the way around. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to go to uh, picture and picture. And make sure, see if this works. I don't know if that works. OK, so let me go ahead and give everyone now the chance to finally unmute yourselves. And uh, let's check here again here. Oh, here we go. I I'm, I'm on the wrong screen. OK, so let me switch to the uh, proper screen here. And we should be able to see both ACP and the telescope here at the same time. If you're not seeing that, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me. And what's going to happen here is in, in the background where you can't see is it's going to take a 20 second exposure for plate solving. And then once it plate solves, it'll precisely center the Andromeda galaxy on our big uh, CCD chip. And then it'll look for a guide star. Um, and then we'll auto guide and take our five minute exposure. And <laughs> ironically enough, the big scope here, our, our 20 inch plane wave becomes the guide scope. It's like the largest guide scope in the world for a, a scope this size. So again, we're using the little scope here, the Takahashi, uh, for starters, because the Andromeda galaxy is big. It's way too big to fit uh, the whole thing, even with our massive chip on the 20 inch here. So you can see we've already acquired a guide star and we have begun our five minute exposure. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing here for a minute. And uh, anyone have any uh, questions or comments or just want to say hi? All the above? <laughs> Who? Oh. I got the, I got uh, the uh, uh, replaced on the cover for the dew shield. I said okay. to take it out. Okay, so Anna Daly, she, she's reported she's fixed the uh, uh, soft cover for our 16 inch at the observatory in Kalamazoo. So that's good news. Richard, what's the latitude of Portal, Arizona? Uh, the latitude is about 32 degrees. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're, they're roughly about 10 degrees lower than we are. And if you didn't get the message either through the club email or the online viewing session email list, um, <sighs> at, at the very end of tonight's session, 
Uh, we are going to try to nab the comet that's currently visible in the sky, uh, Comet C2022E3ZTF. We'll just call it uh, E3 for short, I guess. Sounds good. Just, yep. And we'll have to switch back to the Takahashi to do that uh, because it could be uh, problematic to get it really fast with the plane wave. I've experienced that already. <laughs> So any other questions about uh, the telescope or? Is that camera color or black and white? <laughs> it is a monochrome camera. Okay. So I, know, I know people would love much more to have a color camera. Uh, but again, we use this telescope for high advanced imaging, high end imaging. So it's best to do uh, really good imaging with a monochrome camera because the resolution is much, much sharper. Uh, so all Richard? the images will be in black and white. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Uh, is the roof of the observatory motorized or does somebody have to actually physically open it? No, it is uh, motorized, which is why we couldn't start in November because the one of the bushings to the motor broke. Ah. <laughs> and yeah, uh, back in the old days, at Owl Observatory at the Nature Center, we used to use a big stick. But to do that with uh, a PEC Observatory, you'd have to have maybe a couple of big sticks and a couple of bodybuilders because that thing is heavy. Uh, so there's no way anybody could push that thing off. You can't quite see. Uh, I, I saw him earlier, but you can see Mike Patton in the warm room of the observatory. There he is waving. So Mike Patton, he's actually on site. He has like a double front row seat. Not only is he here on Zoom like you folks, but he's also basically just outside where the telescope is. And you can see Jim Kurtz, who installed the uh, Nightcrawler there for us, is there. So thanks for that, Jim. All right, shall we check in to see how we're doing? Trying to figure out how to change screens really fast and show the telescope. I don't, I guess we really don't need to show the telescope anymore, but oh well. Okay, so it looks like we're nearly done with our exposure. And if you've ever attended one of these sessions before, what I like when I first bring the image up, I want everyone to unmute themselves so I can hear your reaction when you see the picture. Cause I like hearing those oohs and ahs. It makes it more interactive too. I just want to feel like I'm not alone here. <laughs> you're not alone, Richard. Okay. Okay. No, you're not alone. Very nice introduction tonight. I like that. Very good. Thank you. Richard, when you were showing how to find Andromeda, I always remember go left two stars and up two stars and then just a little beyond and that's where it's at. There you go. That works. The other thing is, uh, oh, shoot. What's the other constellation? It acts like an arrow that points down to it. Um, the one that looks like a W. Uh, uh, Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia. Yeah, Cassiopeia kind of has an arrow pointing right down toward Andromeda also. And I will comment, uh, as predicted by the clear sky clock or clear sky chart, whatever they call it now, uh, the scene tonight is terrible. Mm. So, so that's why it's all zigzaggy here. Mm. All right, so here it comes. So what happens in the background is a program called Maxim receives the image, does a quick rescaling and processing, and then up uploads it to um, the uh, image here. And you can see we have a bit of a halo. Mm -hmm. That's you. probably caused by either uh, clouds or both the moon. Ooh, that's that can't be right. 32, <laughs> my, my goodness, the scene's really bad. OK, and we have to wait for this little thing to pop up, because as we've learned really early on, it takes a second for the larger image to actually upload. So it's ready. Yep. Are we all ready? Yes. yes. Here we go. Yeah. And you'll see there's an upgrade here. Upgrade here. There's an echo, too. <laughs> is here, here. With the new upgrade of ACP, the image is bigger. Wow. Ooh. 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 Ah. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Oh. Nice. Oh, no. well trained. Wonderful. So I'll try to go full screen here. That 
Hopefully, it looks a little bit better. Mm -hmm. it's a little bit next to it. <laughs> about 20 years ago in the Rockies, uh, camping up about 9,000 feet, I saw that with naked eye, tilted a different angle, so I don't know why, but the point was, it was amazing to see it in the super dark night sky. Awesome. Yes, it, it is uh, quite impressive. All right, so let me give you some facts and figures, a little bit of science here behind the Andromeda galaxy. It is the largest, most massive galaxy in the local group, as I kind of alluded to earlier. It's um, the bright portion, roughly from, say, here to here, is about 130,000 light years apart. For comparison, wow. our galaxy is thought to be about 100,000 light years apart. But even in this kind of not best image ever, you can see the galaxy extends further. So we believe the galaxy extends upwards of 220,000 light years across. It contains 1 trillion stars compared to between 200 and 400 billion stars for the Milky Way. And deep down in the central bulge here, the very center of the galaxy, there's uh, known to be a 1.5 trillion solar mass black hole. Whoa. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, wait, that's that's not right. Um, I, I didn't read that right. This contains a 100 million solar mass black hole, which compares to 4 million solar masses for our black hole. What I meant to say is the galaxy itself weighs about 1.5 trillion times the sun which is uh, a little bit more than 850 billion solar masses for the Milky Way. But there are some studies that contest that, that suggest the Milky Way actually has more dark matter, and it may actually be more massive than the Andromeda galaxy. And we can see, uh, uh, technically south, and it's even kind of correctly oriented here, is we have M32, one of the dwarf um, elliptical galaxies that orbit M31. And, and in fact, it's located about 24 arc minutes uh, south of M31's nucleus. So that gives you a sense of scale here. For comparison, the full moon is 30 arc minutes. So between here and here is 24 arc minutes. So, you, so, so, the, so the moon would be this big thing here. Cool. And this galaxy is about 6,000 light years across and contains about 400 million known stars. It's one of the densest galaxies known. You know, a lot of stars packed into a relatively small area. Are and they it, all? Yes, go ahead. For, are they forming new new uh, stars? Are they heavy in, in uh, no, hydrogen? No, uh, elliptical galaxies typically do not contain any gas or dust. And so we don't normally see star formation in elliptical galaxies. Thank you, okay. Yeah. And there is thought to be a 2.5 million solar mass black hole in this galaxy alone. So even though it's a lot smaller than the Milky Way, the black hole is uh, a half the mass of ours. And then you can see another satellite galaxy here called M110, which is the last entry in the Messier catalog. It's also known as NGC 205, and this contains about 10 billion stars and it's about 16,000 light years across. And oddly enough, there's no evidence for a supermassive black hole here, which is kind of unusual. Weird. And, and there is a little bit of dust in this galaxy. You, you can't quite see it here, but there is. Um, but there's really no star formation to speak of. So there we have it, the Andromeda galaxy. Not the best image we've ever taken during an online viewing session, but again, we got some clouds and we got some moon, mm -hmm. but I am not complaining considering the problems we've had uh, so far this season. Very, very nice. Brings back some nice memories. Thank you very much. It does. And it looks like we did catch a satellite. I don't know if you can see it. We did catch a satellite going like right through the center of the galaxy, which is extremely rude. And and maybe even another one here. So it's a busy sky up there. I think I even see another one here. Holy cow. Although th this could be a CCD artifact here. It's so straight because we're starting to get some of those. Yeah, I don't see them. Thank you. Well, remember, I'm going to go ahead and close the image now. And, and just remember, uh, after tonight, when I get a chance to process all the pictures we've taken tonight, you'll have a chance to download higher resolution versions of these than, than we even saw here. 
And so uh, you'll, you'll get a chance to uh, closer, most more closely inspect them later. Okay, so now I'm before I leave uh, the ACP screen here on the browser, I'm going to type in our next target just to save time here. And I think we'll go ahead and stick with, uh, let's try uh, three minutes, maybe to dampen down the moon glow because we are kind of near the moon there. And uh, we'll go ahead and hit acquire image and switch back to the old PowerPoint here. And let me give you a little intro of what we're going to look at now. So yes, our next target is M45, the Pleiades. Everyone knows and loves the Pleiades. So it's referred to as the seven sisters after the seven doves that carried ambrosia to the infant Zeus or to the seven sisters who were placed in the heavens so they might forget their grief over the fate of their father Atlas uh, condemned to support the sky on his shoulders. And I think everyone has an idea of where the Pleiades is located. Of course, the moon's like right around here somewhere. So maybe I shouldn't have done this one, but uh, we do love doing the Pleiades. So you can go up to Orion, you know, follow the stars up through the Hyades here and up to the Pleiades. And when many people find the Pleiades for the first time, they mistake it for the Little Dipper because it does look like a little mini dipper in the sky. So we can really say we got the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and if you want, you can call this the Mini Dipper if you don't want to call it the Pleiades. So here's a bit of a closer view. And by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, these images here, th this kind of star atlas view, these come from Sky and Telescope's pocket sky atlas that I scanned. And um, if you're looking for a really handy guide for your binoculars or uh, telescope, I highly recommend uh, Sky and Telescope's uh, Jumbo pocket sky atlas because this is from the Jumbo version. So I want to make sure I give them a plug because I kind of shamelessly scan and use uh, their images here. So here's a closer view of the Hyades, which does not include Eldebaran. That's actually a foreground star. But we go past the Hyades up to the Pleiades there. And uh, the Sky Atlas contains an even closer view of the Pleiades. So, of course, it's known as the Seven Sisters, but most people can maybe easily count six stars only. But 10 stars brighter than six magnitude are visible. And in fact, the, the well-known observer, Stephen James O'Mara, who, who was with Sky and Telescope for years and then astronomy, I he, think he might still be with astronomy, but I'm not really sure anymore. Uh, he once saw 17 Pleiades, 17 members of the Pleiades from Cambridge, Massachusetts. But of course, he's known for his really keen vision. So yeah, if you really, really try, you can see up to 17 stars in the Pleiades, assuming your uh, vision is really good or you have a really good prescription for your glasses. So uh, it's been, no of course, it's been known since ancient times and cultures across the world, in including uh, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Persians, Mayans, uh, the Cherokee, Aztec, the Sioux, and the Aborigines. They've all documented uh, this group of stars. And the Japanese mention it as Michura Bushi. I, I'm sure I butchered that, which means, of course, six stars. Uh, in documents dating back to the 8th century. And they are also known as Subaru meaning coming together or cluster. So maybe you drive a Subaru, which has a little star symbol on the hood there, and that's supposed to be a representation of the Pleiades. In fact, uh, it's mentioned in the Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, uh, the Bible, and the Quran, uh, uh, amongst other texts. So it is uh, quite well known. All right, so let's switch back to ACP here and see how we're doing. We're almost there, so let me quickly go to, let's see how we're pointing now. So, whoa, there we are. So I'm just going to hit reload. This just kind of a habit when I switch screens here, but I believe that image was accurate. So you can see the Pleiades is uh, pretty much at the zenith. It's really, really high. Same with the moon. 
And you can see it does look like our, our Takahashi will collide with the walls here, but you can see we just barely make it. So we, we, we could not have a bigger scope in the observatory than the 20 inch here, because our if we did, we'd have to get rid of the Takahashi and heaven forbid we do that because it's an awesome telescope. All right, we gotta be getting close now. Very, very close. Well, the scene looks better at the zenith. So that's not too surprising because we're looking very, very high through less air in the atmosphere. And I hope it isn't too washed out. But we'll do our best here. And you can see we have the camera cooled to minus 20 degrees Celsius, which helps reduce noise. Digital cameras can be very noisy. There we go. Oh, my goodness. We should check the All Sky camera, too. All right. Oh, that, that was quick. All right. Here we go. Everyone ready for the Pleiades? Yep. All right. Click. I like how it kind of unveils itself like that. Like a Ooh, very nice. Man, Beautiful. another satellite. Beautiful. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm not See, seeing the satellite. This is wow. It might it, it might not come through on Zoom, but the satellite looks like it's right here. But again, when you get those higher resolution images, oh, you, should, you, you should be able to see it easy. Thank you, Elon Musk. Well, that might not be his My fault. <laughs> but it probably is. It, it probably is. Let's just go ahead and blame Elon. Yeah, why not? He'll be, I'm he'll... So again, not the best image of the Pleiades we've ever had, no, but no. let's... Uh, quickly go, go back here and see how we're doing. Yeah, we still got those thin clouds. They're not going to go away tonight, unfortunately. But hey, it's better than nothing, right? <laughs> right. Beggars, beggars can't be choosers. So I can scroll up and, of course, the Pleiades is what we want to see, but I can scroll up and down here. Oh, and there's another one. That's a big one. Man, oh. it is a busy oh. night up there. Streaky. Now I know why my neighbor used to call this the shopping cart cluster. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yes, the shopping cart. How's it feel? Call it the what? Shopping cart cluster. Oh, yeah. So and there's the wheels. <laughs> most prominent here is Merope. That that's the most prominent nebula here. So let me tell you a little bit about the science and uh, a little bit of knowledge behind the Pleiades here. The Pleiades is about 100 million years old. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody here for just a second. Sorry. It contains, or the Pleiades is about 100 million years old. And it's composed of a hot, blue, highly luminous stars belonging to spectral type B and downwards. You know, there's the spectral types, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, or O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. I know it's a little sexist by today's standards, and some of my former students said that, but I told them it's easy to remember, and when you're taking a test, would you prefer to get a good grade or be politically correct? And they said they'd prefer to get a good grade, so uh, so we use the old standard, O, B, a fine girl, or guy, kiss me. So, of course, there's no type O stars in this cluster because they don't live more than maybe six, seven million years. So at 100 million years old, if there were ever any type O stars in this cluster, they all went supernova. They all blew up. So it does contain a, a spectral type B, which is the second uh, most massive type of star, and downward. Uh, it contains about 100 stars in a sphere about 15 light years in diameter and has a tidal radius of about 43 light years meaning stars it's kind of spewed behind. We'll talk about that more with another cluster later. And its total population is roughly uh, over 1,000 stars, not including un unresolved spectroscopic binaries. Stars you can only tell that are binaries through their spectrum. 
the cluster will survive for maybe another 250 million years, but that is difficult to estimate. And the reflection nebula, which you can see best around Merope here, uh, was once thought to be leftover material from the cluster's formation. But um, now we know the Pleiades is just passing through the Taurus Auriga complex of dark nebulae. In fact, in really deep images of the region, you can see the Pleiades plowing through this dark cloud along the disk of our galaxy. It does contain many brown dwarfs. Can't really see any in the picture, though. And they make up about 25 of the cluster's total population, but less than 2% of the cluster's total mass. So there you go. That's the Pleiades. It's a great unaided eye object and great with binoculars and wide field telescopes. And one more feature to point out that I've been trying to get to catch on is this line of stars here, which I call the Bell String. Now, the fact that my last name is Bell is just a coincidence, of course, but please, from here on out, refer to this as the Bell String, okay? We're trying to get that to catch on. Please, please. <laughs> I don't hear anyone giving any promises out there. All right, so let's go ahead and go to our next target with the Takahashi, which is also our final target. Uh-oh, I'm blanking. Uh, what's the IC number of the Horsehead Nebula? I have it down as B33, which I don't think will show up. Let's try that. I think it's 430. Yeah, it's 434. Let's Let's try that. I, I had a brain fart there, 434. That sounds about right. So we're a little further away from the moon. So let's go back to five minutes there and uh, hit acquire image. Do I have it set so you can't unmute yourself? No, I, I do. You guys can, you're being very quiet all of a sudden. All right, so I, I, I'm pretty sure I hit uh, get coordinates. Yeah, yeah. Did you change the time of the exposure or do you want three minutes no no we'll do five minutes i did change that okay because it's in seconds okay slewing to ic 434 that's good oh you well, see I... the scope slew yeah let's do that uh there she goes so it looks like we have to go all the way to the other side of the meridian but that's okay And uh, this this white panel here, you can't quite see the whole thing because the scope gets in the way. That's our large optic uh, uh, flat panel for the for the twenty inch. The Takahashi has its own flat panel built in, and this is Mike Patton's Coronado Coronado ninety. You, you can just see the end of its seven inch refractor here. So you can see it moves kind of slow. We have so many cords going through here that when we slew it at the higher speed, it, it, it tended to stall on us. So we have it turned or moved kind of on the slow side. This gives you a nice uh, view of the whole telescope there, both, both, both sides. And I can't give you a weather report. Of course, the uh, Clarity 2 weather station says it's clear. When but I wouldn't quite judge it clear. Uh, the wind is only 2.2 miles per hour, much lower than forecast. Uh, the humidity is only 29%, which just makes me sad. And the ambient temperature is measured to be 44.6 degrees. So that's a quick weather report from Arizona Sky Village. All right, so while we're slewing here, let me go back to the old uh, trusty PowerPoint here. And I forgot to mention, oh, because I threw this in, is one thing we uh, like to do if we have them is show color images of the in, of the targets we have tonight. And we just have that such a thing for the Pleiades. So here it is. This is taken by me, Richard Bell, with the uh, Takahashi we just used on a much clearer and moonless night. These clouds you want here, 
those are deep space clouds, not earth clouds. <laughs> so yeah, this is taken with our uh, uh, Takahashi and uh, S-Big camera. And it's a four hour total exposure through luminance, red, green, and blue filters to give the color view that you see here. And you can see some of the Taurus molecular cloud. We can switch to a little close up view here. And you can really see the bell string. Remember, call, call, call it the bell string. And some of the nebulosity, uh, especially around Merope there, really, really comes out in this image here. Hey, Richard. Yeah. In the chat, Kathy wanted to know what the flat panel was. OK, so um, flat panels help us take flat images, which, which helps correct for what's called vignetting where it gets rid of maybe dark edges around the picture. It helps remove dust. And it's basically a way to calibrate the, the picture so it looks nice and pretty. So that's the really short version. OK, so here's our next target, uh, B33 or Barnard 33, which um, is the Horsehead Nebula itself. But IC434 uh, uh, is the uh, nebula behind the horse head that allows us to even see the horse head. So it's roughly uh, 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 1,375 light years away. That'll sound familiar here with our next target with the plane wave, the big scope, which we'll switch to next. And uh, here is its general location in the sky. It hangs, hangs, uh, hangs right below uh, Alnatec or Zeta Orionis. So, so it actually kind of the, the the horse head kind of points off this way, you know, from from the like the top of the head. So it's kind of like a, a, at a ninety degree angle from how I usually see it in uh, pictures. And so it's uh, in fact located about uh, thirty arc minutes south of Alnatec, right here. It looks like it's closer, but maybe that's a typo. Maybe it should be thirty arc seconds and not thirty minutes, as I have here in my notes. So hmm, that, that could be wrong. And the nebula uh, was first recorded on a photographic plate in 1888 by the Scottish astronomer Wilhelmina Fleming at Harvard College Ob Observatory. This is her standing right here. So this is the lady that discovered the Horsehead Nebula in a photographic uh, plate. And Edward Pickering, the, this uh, guy standing here, uh, claimed that his maid could do a better job of identifying and cataloging the observatory images. And he hired his maid, who was Fleming, uh, along with several, several other women who became known as computers. They did uh, lots of calculations and measurements on photographic plates because back in their time, uh, women who got degrees in astronomy uh, were not allowed to actually operate telescopes. Why, I don't know, but, you know, men are pigs, and I guess some things uh, never change. They just slightly improve over the years. And so in addition to discovering the horse head, Fleming discovered 58 other gaseous nebulae, 10 nova, and more than 300 variable stars. She became the first American woman to be elected as an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society of London, and photographing it in 1894, Edward Emerson Barnard, E.E. E. Barnard, described it as a dark mass, diameter four arc minutes, on nebulous strip extending south of Zeta Orionis. So he made no mention that it looks like a horse. So there you go, a little bit of background behind the Horsehead Nebula. Let's see how we're doing. So we're roughly halfway into our exposure. And we did not get a guide star tonight. Oh, I can see st guide stars on the uh, auto guider image, but maybe because of the clouds, uh, they didn't quite register on the image. But that shouldn't be a problem because the Takahashi is very wide field and the Paramount is a really, really good mount when the circuit board doesn't break down. <laughs> so it shouldn't be too bad. It should look pretty sharp. And yeah, I, I, I know there's questions in the chat, but when, when I'm operating the scope, operating this and that, I don't have time to look at the chat. That's why I prefer people ask questions verbally. So if anybody wants to read me uh, any more questions in the chat, I am happy to take them or any other questions that anybody wants to ask. So let's go back to the home screen here.
I saw a question in the chat about whether the observatory out there needs to be heated or cooled. Like uh, no, no, we uh, don't want it to be heated for sure. Um, air conditioning would be nice when it gets really hot, but it only gets, you know, it gets really hot. It, or it gets hottest in the summer and uh from roughly july uh through the end of september we shut the place down we unplug everything because uh the telescope has no insurance because it's located on somebody else's property so we had a, a it, it was basically impossible to get insurance so out of an abundance of caution we shut the whole thing down during the monsoon season because people out there have had lightning strikes that have fried their equipment Wow. Of course, they were covered by insurance, but we would not be. So uh, Mike Patton does not uh, uh, cool or heat the observatory itself in any way, and, and it doesn't, frankly, need it. I, we've never seen a great need for it. Tell us about the 20-inch scope. This is my first time. Uh, joining in so uh, that looks interesting yeah we're going to switch to the 20 inch here shortly i'll show you some pictures and i'll tell you more about it in in, in, ju in just a second so i will get back to that okay all right let's go back and uh, see how we're doing on acp here oh we just we just finished and the image popped up already wow the internet must be going really fast out there are, are we ready? Yep. Yes. Here, here we go. Horsey time. <laughs> Yay. Ooh. Oh, good shot. There it is. Here's the the wow. Right? Let, me, let, me, let me try. Uh, <laughs> really? Nice. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's unusual. Oh, there's another satellite. Oh, yeah, I see it. So this is uh, Zeta Orionis. I'm pretty darn sure of that. Yeah, you're right. It's beautiful. And I remember my, my oldest niece, who uh, is almost uh, 20, 27 now. And uh, when I first showed this to her, when she was like three or four years old, I asked her what this looks like. And she said, horsey. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, it, so it's pretty obvious uh, of why we call that the Horsehead Nebula. That well, looks like Horsehead. What's that down there, then? That's kind of interesting. Ah, that is a good question. This is known as the Flame Nebula. We oh. sometimes look at that up close with the 20 inch, and it is freaking awesome, if I, might, if I do say so mm -hmm. myself. Pictures of the flame. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought the horse head looked like a chess piece. It does. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Yep. I'm having trouble seeing any horse in there. Whoops. Gotta zoom in on it, kind of. Yeah. Oh, and the one place I want to go, maybe I can. This is as much as I can zoom in on it now, but you can see the uh, the, the, the snout is pointing down. I wanted to go. I spoke to the Kashmir. Okay, we're going to mute everybody there. I think uh, we need to remind people when you're on Zoom, you cannot have conversations with other people around you. If you do, please mute yourself. So things were getting a little hectic there, so we'll mute everyone. So if you do have any more questions or comments, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. But let me again tell you some of the little science behind the horse head while we admire the picture here. So the mass of the nebula is estimated to contain enough material to contain 10,000 sun-like stars. But of course, nature is not that efficient, and only a tiny fraction of that may actually become stars. There's an extremely young cluster, only uh, uh, 300,000 to 1 million years old. Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong slide. <laughs> That's for the next target. Oh, shoot. I, I, I should look at the title behind my notes. So. Let me start over. <laughs> so the dark nebula forming the horse head is about 3.2 light years tall. And that's by my math, because I couldn't find any from any other source what the height of this would be from roughly, say, here to here. So I did a little bit of trigonometry and I got about 3.2 light years, which seems fairly reasonable uh, to me. 
And basically all the dust and gas you see here is part of the much larger Orion molecular cloud complex, which is composed of two, two giant molecular clouds called Orion A and Orion B. The horse head is a part of the Orion B complex. The background emission nebula, which is seen here, that's known as IC 434. While again, the horse head itself is known as Barnard 33. And the nebula was discovered by William Herschel on February 1st, 1786, and is illuminated by Sigma Orionis. I'm guessing this is Sigma, but if you have a star chart handy, you can correct me. Who knows, it could be this star here, but I'm guessing that's this one, but who knows for certain. And the emission and reflection nebula NGC 2023 is located to the horse head's lower left. And that's the flame nebula here. And that was also discovered by William Herschel, but in this case, on January 6, 1785. NGC uh, 2023 is illuminated by HD 37903, which has a spectral class of B2VE. I'm not sure what the E stands for, but the, the Roman numeral V in B2V means it's a main sequence star like the sun where it fuses hydrogen and the helium. And again, this is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is NGC 2023. This is NGC 2024, which is the flame nebula. Next time I'll read my notes in advance to refresh my memory. <laughs> but there we go. This is a, a great target with the Takahashi because you can capture all the nebulosity nearby. This kind of glowy thing, that's mostly uh, uh, probably thin clouds and moonlight that, again, is wreaking havoc on our uh, conditions here. But uh, you know, pretty much everything else is nebulosity in the Orion complex here. And up close with a 20 inch, it looks pretty awesome. I don't know if we'll do that next month, but... We're uh, not going to do it tonight for sure. Oh, Brockmire, you forgot to do it. All right, so let's go off to our next target here. But um, first, I have to do something down here. And we're going to hit the old switch from Takahashi to the CDK20. And go back to the old trusty PowerPoint here. And so as seen there, we're going to switch to the big scope now. So we're going to say goodbye to the FSQ-106, the Takahashi refractor, and we're going to move off to the big scope. So we're going to use the big scope, uh, not quite last, because we will switch back to the talk to do the comet. But uh, now we're going to use the, uh, the main scope here, our uh, plane wave CDK-20, which is a 20-inch uh, uh, corrected dull Kirkham telescope, which means it has an ellipsoidal primary, a spherical secondary, with a lens group in the back. That's the C part in CDK-20, which means it's corrected. That's supposed to give a pretty uh, a coma-free uh, and flat field. But we do have a bit of vignetting because we had to relocate the secondary mirror uh, to reach focus with our uh, what's called an on-axis guider. And one of these days, we're going to try to uh, uh, experiment and see if we can fix that. So you can see that the, the entire scope here, this part here, weighs about 140 pounds. So it's quite heavy. It has an all carbon fiber design because that helps minimize thermal expansion. And you can see the imaging train on the back here that we can switch uh, up close to. So again, we're using the same camera that we use with the Takahashi, just, you know, or the same model, not the same exact camera, and uh, the same set of filters and filter wheel. Uh, this is the on-axis guider, and this is our current auto guider, a ZWO ASI 174MM uh, monochrome auto guider. And what brings everything to focus is uh, what blends in with the back of the telescope here, this little box here. You can't see it terribly well in this picture. That's our Finger Lakes instrument Atlas Digital Focuser. And when we do focus with this thing, you know, you normally we normally can't hear it. That's, this thing is loud, but it works very, very well. We have not had, we have not had an issue with the focuser uh, at all. 
And of course, here is the uh, heart of the system, the software BISC Paramount ME2. So this drives the two telescopes. It does have a 240 pound capacity. So between the 140 pound plane wave and the Takahashi, we're probably upwards of 170, 180 pounds. So uh, we're nowhere near tapping the capability of this mount. And I won't bother to go into all the juicy details here, but needless to say, it uh, it does very well, except there, there, there are the occasional issues with the circuit board, as many others have encountered, as well as us. All right, so maybe I'll let you read, if, if, if you want to read that screen in more detail, let me switch back to the plane wave here. And, uh, uh oh, something... So we had a technical issue here. We uh, couldn't switch, so we'll have, we'll have to, um, we, we've been having issues with that. So I'm going to run the general startup routine. And so that, that'll take another minute or so, a couple of minutes to get going. So we've had some other technical gl glitches that we're working on. I think it's mostly related to our issues uh, connecting to the flip flat on the Takahashi, because for some reason, when we fired everything back up this season, uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't automatically open the flip flat. So that might be the problem we're having, but I don't know why it happens so early. So we'll just do a quick switch here. It shouldn't take terribly long at all because everything's already running. I know the scope will slew back to the home position. So maybe if you're tired of looking at the uh, slide there, we can switch back to the live view in the observatory. And just out of abundance of caution, I see stuff fly by. So I think we're running there. The occasional insect will fly by. You can see we have the KS logo. Since this is our corner of the observatory, that's kind of like planting our flag, I guess. And... Uh, we can close the flip flat. Maybe you'll see that close there. There it goes. So the flip flat is closing. We'll have to open it later, of course. So I think I'm just gonna open it back up just to, to save time later. There we go. So now the telescope is gonna home itself because we're, ha we're, we're having to use the full startup routine instead of our uh, program to quickly switch between two telescopes. But you get to see the telescope move again. And I'm certainly, uh, we welcome uh, other comments or questions while we're waiting to pass the time. I've been seeing a lot of cool pictures of the comet. Um, yeah. But quite there's a few. Been nothing but clouds here. So, yep, no view here in Michigan. So I, I posted this earlier, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and post it again. So if you're not a member, here's a link to download the latest issue of our newsletter, Prime Focus. Uh, this month, I got permission to use an article on the comet from the bad astronomer, Phil Plate. So if you read his uh, online newsletter, you may have read this already, but uh, he, he gave me kind permission to use it. So feel free to download our the February issue of our newsletter, Prime Focus. All right, so we're back to the home position there. Let's check on our progress. You can see the startup script uh, run here. So it's our, of course, the sky was already running. Uh, it's it, It'll discover the Paramount is already connected. And now it has to restart Maximum because this is, I, I mentioned we had an issue having two identical cameras as we had, we have two special scripts uh, to work with the uh, identical cameras because, you know, they basically use the same uh, driver. And that's caused a couple of problems over the years, but with that, we mostly have it resolved. So 
except for some reason the the uh, script to switch scopes isn't working for some reason. But that's been a low priority between getting the mount working again and uh, getting the new focuser set on the Takahashi. Uh, Richard, if you uh, are a person that's been trained in using the telescope for yourself, how how do you uh, book time and uh, how would you run a program for the night? Is it automated or do you have to uh, go live and change the objects as you're doing tonight? Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um... Most of us kind of control the telescope uh, live. And so we kind of enter the objects one by one. But normally with, with today's imaging, we spend like the entire night on one target. But if, you want, but if you want to maximize your time and image objects when they're highest, then it does help to have a script. And so there's a, a, a free program you can download called ACP Planner which hardly any, no one has used yet. And you can create plans to image multiple objects automatically through the night. And you can even set the telescope to shut down automatically. It'll, it'll you know, park itself. The power will turn off and the roof will roll on if you don't want to watch it the whole night. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. But usually most of us just uh, uh, control it live. But if you can't stay up the whole night, you can just set it to run automatically and it'll shut down for you but uh it will not start up by itself and start taking pictures okay so the uh 20 inch is ready let me uh enter our first target before we do our intro here so we're gonna go to a very famous object m42 and let's go ahead and scale back to three minutes. I think that'll be good with the moon tonight. And, uh, oh heck, let's go ahead and do uh, hydrogen alpha. So let's, so let's go back to five minutes with hydrogen alpha. Oops. Because uh, hydrogen alpha shouldn't be bothered by moonlight uh, too much, but unless the moon's really close, but it's not too close to the Orion Nebula. So let's see how we do. Oh, and I almost forgot. In ACP on the remote computer, I got to change the focal length and aperture that's entered because ACP is only meant to work with one telescope. But we have to go in and manually change the aperture and the focal length, which I usually forget to do. So I am very proud of myself for remembering to do that. And I forgot to have someone remind me. So next time, remind me to remind you to remind me to switch the aperture and focal length in ACP. Okay, we're ready to go. So now I want to hit acquire image. And you can see it gets pretty messy here if you enter in multiple targets. So what you can do is you can hit fold and unfold. And look, now it's nice and clean. <laughs> All right, so there's back to our software bisque, but we're going to talk about this target here. This is one we do every season. Uh, sometimes we do it twice, once with the Takahashi and once with the plane wave. But tonight, we're going to do it with the plane wave. So the most amazing fact that always stuns me when I uh, think about the Orion Nebula is it was not known to pre-telescopic observers, which is amazing because you can see the thing as kind of this funny glowing cloud with your unaided eye. It may be star-like, so maybe that's why nobody ever noticed it, but you can see it, maybe not directly looking at it, but with what we call averted vision. But it may have been mentioned in, in the Mayans creation myth of the three hearthstones. In the myth, the nebula represents the embers of a fiery creation. But it's not mentioned by Ptolemy in the Almagest, uh, uh, published in the second second century, or the Persian, or or by the Persian astronomer El Sufi, in the Book of Fixed Stars in 964 CE, even though uh, they charted other patches of nebulosity in the sky. Uh, uh, Tycho Brahe, 
the guy with the gold nose you might have heard of late in the 16th century and Johann Baer in 1603 designated the Orion Nebula as Theta Orionis because it looked star-like to them, but uh, they thought it was a star, but it does look nebulous to the naked eye. At Galileo observed this region in 1610 and 1617, but made no note of its nebulosity. It was first discovered by the French astronomer Nicolas Claude Fabry de, de Pisic on November 26, 1610, and it was designated as NGC 1976 in the new general catalog. In uh, 33, which is the little uh, head here of the nebula, uh, is part of the Orion Nebula, which is surrounded by what's known as Bond's Star. It is located in the Sword of Orion. And you can see it's uh, fairly large and it is fairly easy to see with the unaided eye. But again, not, not directly. You do need some adverted vision. Uh, to see it. But in binoculars, uh, you can really see the shape of the nebula, and it is, it is quite spectacular. Let's see what position the telescope is in. That looks like it moved. Yep, because it was in the home position. So there's the current position of the big scope. And again, we're using the big scope now, which, which both auto guides and takes the picture. It's still centering the target, actually, because it had to slew all the way around again. So we have not uh, yet started looking for a guide star. So we can scroll down here and see what's going on. Now it's switching filters. And I do see plenty of bright guide stars in the uh, computer that's out in the observatory, which I have on another laptop here and we have acquired a guide star which should pop up here unfortunately as it guides this doesn't update you just get the graph and we're going to do a five minute exposure in hydrogen alpha it's still trying to figure out how to properly guide but we do have a guide star as seen here and there we go it's guiding so we just started our five minute exposure. Let's go ahead and go back to Zoom here and say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, Richard. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, Howdy doody. Hello. Yo, Richard. Hello. Good evening, Richard. Hello. Hello, hello. one and all. I, I did notice in the chat earlier, uh, aside from several members in the Southwest Michigan region, we have uh, people are joining us from around the country, which is fantastic. Cam radio or something? Oh. I'm sorry? Yeah, you're I looking in the back behind me? <clears throat> yeah, it's a ham radio. Oh, okay. I've got another ham radio guy. Jack Price is also into that kind of thing. And while we're waiting, I do want to thank uh, Kevin Jung. He's our co-host for tonight. So he let many of you in. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for helping out, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what we can do, let's go back to the All Sky camera. Let's see how the weather's doing out there. It is clearing up. Clouds have mostly parted. Oh, it is clear. And it'll take uh, forever to get this thing out of the sky. I so know. that's what stars are like. Yeah, hmm. when they maybe when they blow up. <laughs> well, no, I you know we haven't seen many of those here in Michigan for oh, quite a oh, while. These, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, these little things. Yeah, they're they're nice to see again. Yeah. Oh, and if you are very familiar with our all sky camera, uh, and might because. Because I recognized it right away because no one looks at the all sky camera more than I do. Is Mike Patton has a new neighbor. So there's like a new building here, new house and maybe observatory. I'm not sure what the little red building is. Maybe it's a storage shed. Maybe it's an observatory. Mike, Mike Patton could tell us if he's listening. It's a, it's a work trailer. <laughs> it could be. 
It is. Is it? Oh, oh, it's a work. Oh, that is Mike. Okay. Okay, so it's a trailer. Yeah. It's, it's hard to tell the scale. It's a big trailer. Yeah, well, it looks like it could be converted to an observatory. There, there you go. He's building his observatory on the other side of the house. Mm. Okay. And, then, and as you, uh, I don't know if you read here, but we do a, a, I don't think it says the exposure length, but we do a one minute exposure every four minutes. And so that, that's why we have the web page here uh, set to reload every four minutes, even though they're never, they're never synced uh, in precision. That'd be really hard to do for each person that visits the page. You can see uh, the sickle here in Leo the Lion. This is Regulus with the sickle. You can't see all of it, but that is the sickle, unmistakably. Uh -huh. So the spring constellations are coming. Slowly, but surely. And you can see this feature here. This is the roof of the observatory. And this is Mike Patton's house right there. Richard, what's that red dot right there uh, on the right-hand side? Here? Uh, up that, a little higher. Like, oh, go, this? Yeah, what Next is that? Uh, this is Jupiter. This is probably yeah. a reflection from maybe one of that. the lights of the moon. The, oh, okay. the, the, this is not real. Okay, I was like, what in the world is that? Yeah, so this is some kind of artifact. It could be a hot pixel, could be a reflection. Okay, gotcha. You can see fainter ones uh, here and there. Oh, yeah, 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 you can. But but this is a real red light at someone's house. Because everyone at Arizona Sky Village, uh, they're supposed to close their drapes at night um, in case anyone's uh, observing or imaging. So let's switch back. Uh, the scene is lousy again. It's very zigzaggy. But we're almost done with our exposure. And seconds. I wish it did it by the second. We could do like a countdown. <laughs> Be quiet, Don. And for some reason, uh, it, it 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 does not image for more than three hundred seconds, but it shows it going past three hundred seconds for one reason. All right, let's see how we do. This is in hydrogen alpha, so it shouldn't be terribly affected by the moon. But and the clouds have parted. There we go. Oh, it's it's upside down. And since we're using the on-axis guider. Uh, it's a mirror image as well. But I, I, I try to correct that when I uh, process the images and uh, up upload them to the internet for you to download. But sometimes I forget. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Yep. The Orion Nebula in Hydrogen Alpha. Ooh. Oh. Let me try going full screen here. I, I hope that improves the view. Because now the, the <clears throat> thumbnail here is so big. Very nice. Yeah. Definitely. Beautiful. That's gorgeous. All right. So let me give you some information here. The mass of the nebula is estimated to contain enough material to, to create 10,000 sun-like stars. If that sounds familiar, that's because I accidentally read it earlier. <laughs> so uh, this does contain an extremely young cluster, only 300,000 to 1 million years old, of about 300 stars uh, slowly emerging from the Orion Nebula here. In infrared images, you can see them very, very clearly. And so the uh, bright and sharply defined central cavity, which is overexposed here, is called the Huygens region, named after the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens, who first uh, noted and sketched this area. The star Theta Orionis, um, which, which is what they named one of the stars that was charted as the Orion Nebula, is actually a multiple star system, which is really a cluster in a cluster called the trapezium. You can't see it here. 
And to capture the trapezium, uh, we do have to do like like really short, like 10, 30 second exposures just to see the thing because it, it, it is easy to overexpose with a 20 inch scope. So I, I'm sure many of you have observed the trapezium in the Orion Nebula. If you haven't, it's understandable. It's winter, it's cloudy, it's cold. So sometimes it ain't easy to do. So the trapezium consists of eight separate components labeled A through H and possibly a ninth called X that has only been observed twice by E.E. E. Barnard in 1888 and 1889. Was he seeing something real? Because it seems like we would have seen it much better now with uh, modern telescopes like, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't know if Webb has done uh, the trapezium yet. The brightest uh, of them, called Theta-1, or uh, Th Theta-1 or Orionis C, is a, is a magnitude 5.1, is, is magnitude 5.1, and contains 45 times the mass of the sun. It's a huge type O star. The projected distances between the trapezium stars is only about a third of a light year, while the nebula itself, at least along the long axis, is about 24 light years in diameter. It is not the largest known emission nebula or the largest known region of star formation, a stellar nursery, but it is the nearest big one to us. But there are some closer in say Taurus uh, that aren't nearly as big, but do form stars, but this is the nearest biggest stellar nursery to us at about 1,350 light years away, which, if that distance sounds familiar, that's because that's the same distance as the Horsehead Nebula, because all that is part of pretty much the same molecular region. So there we go. We do this one every season. So if you've joined us before or multiple times, you've seen this uh, at least once a season, because it is awesome. We don't often do it in hydrogen alpha, though, so that is a little bit different. And you can get a sense of three dimensions here. You can see this cloud kind of go uh, in front of the Huygens region. So, so you can tell that the Huygens region is a, a cavity inside the nebula. And it is the trapezium that illuminates this entire thing. Except for here, where it's illuminated by Bond star. It's uh, you know, Bond or star, Bond star. That's, that's how you call it. <laughs> all right so there we go all right our next target is brand new this is the first time we've ever done this one so it, it, it is an exclusive target for you folks tonight uh but i've observed it many times and it's known as m46 and this is an open cluster so we don't want to use hydrogen alpha that would look terrible so we're going to have to go back to the luminates and let's go ahead and stick with five minutes and uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can here with the moon. So here we go. And uh, let's see, back to the PowerPoint. Oop, this one. And oops. Uh, One of our members, who I think is joining us tonight, did take an image of this with the with the uh, twenty inch plane wave. So this image is by uh, Dominic uh, Pulo, who I did see log on. So if you have any comments about your image, Dominic, now's the time to say so. But you can see all the stats here. It's roughly an hour and a half image with the luminance and RGB filters. Got some funky artifact here, but. Uh, Shows you the uh, nice thanks, Richard. Yes, that was uh, my first attempt at using the remote, and um, my 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 son uh, Giovanni, who's um, reminiscent of Doctor Lepto, that was here a couple weeks ago. He's thirteen, and he's watching and enjoying the the show tonight. Um, that was my first that was my first attempt at the remote scope. And um, for those of you who haven't tried it yet, it it's it's really fun to do this on your own so um give it a shot great thanks, thanks dominic yeah all right so let's go ahead and go off to our next target which as mentioned is m46 and 
I call it the Puppus Cluster because why not? It's in the constellation Puppus, right? It, it's like the better of the two clusters, or the, the, the two Messier clusters, I should say, in Puppus. There's also M47, which is right nearby. And uh, it doesn't have an official name, so why not call it the Puppus Cluster? And if you know anything about this cluster, it has a special surprise kind of in front of it. I, I won't say in it, but in front of it. More on that here in a second. So M46 was discovered by Charles Messier. He actually found this one himself on February 19th, 1771. It's also cataloged as NGC 2437. Uh, but in fact, Messier added this to his catalog three days after publishing the first edition of his list, which contained uh, objects from M1, the Crab Nebula, to M45, the Pleiades. And this was added with several others, including M47, which is right near this cluster, at least in the sky. Physically, they're uh, not, not even close. So John Luis Emile Dreyer, who compiled the NGC catalog in 1888, described this cluster as very bright, very rich, very large. So here's where we find it in the sky. So um, we can see this one from Michigan, even though it's a little lower for us, but uh, in Arizona, it's about 10 degrees higher. And, uh, but it is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So that does make it a little hard to star hop to. It's um, located about uh, 13 and a half degrees east of Sirius here. So of course, Sirius is really easy to find because it is the brightest star in the night sky. Or you can say it's 10 degrees uh, north of Xi Puppis, which is right here. It's, you know, this isn't the brightest star to find, but um, you can kind of triangulate it here between these two stars if you can't find it. Of course, everyone uses GoTo today, right? And M46, again, is very close to M47. Uh, M46 is about one and a half degrees east of M47, but the two clusters in this case are not related, but they can be viewed together in binoculars. So they're kind of like another double double cluster. But in the case of the famous double cluster in Perseus, those two clusters are at the same distance and have the same age, but these two do not. And M46 is the richer of the two, but I believe M47 is a lot closer. And as mentioned, there's a special treat in this cluster uh, called NGC 2438. You can see it labeled on the Sky Atlas here. And this is a planetary nebula that appears to lie within the cluster, but more on that later. So the planetary nebula was discovered by William Herschel on March 19th, 1786. The nebula is located about 1,370 light years away versus, again, 4,920 light years for M46. So that's one of the reasons why we know the nebula is not in the cluster, because we know the nebula is closer to us. Of course, the distances have a bit of margin of error because they're we have to use uh, various techniques to estimate those distances, but you know the 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 rough margin we have between the two is wide enough to know uh, the planetary nebula is not in the cluster. All right, so let's check in with ACP again, see how we're doing. And there we are, we're guiding. So we're doing good there. And again, the scene is rotten tonight, but that was predicted. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> considering this is our first night and it's the end of January. So we'll go back to Zoom here, and check in with everybody. Still got quite a few folks uh, hanging in there with us, which I very much appreciate. Richard, one of the questions that I have on the guide star when I, cause I see that when I'm on and is there a way to improve that? Or is that just because of the, the, the light and it's having a difficulty really keeping that like what's what's causing the majority of that for folks you mean on the graph how, how the yeah. graph is so choppy that is yes. the atmospheric scene yes so, okay. so, so that's so that is the steadiness of the atmosphere which uh, tonight was predicted to be bad 
And okay. um, even though it was predicted to be clear, but we did have clouds, you know, I, we, we could have considered delaying till tomorrow, but guess what? The scene is predicted to be even worse tomorrow. Uh, so I definitely wanted to do it tonight, even though everything said we would have no clouds and eventually we did. Now there's no clouds in the sky. In Arizona, in Michigan, there's lots oh, no. of clouds. <laughs> there's lots of clouds here. <laughs> we we have not had one clear night from sunrise to sunset uh, since early November, maybe into October. So it's been a typical Michigan winter. We've had uh, half clear nights in December. But uh, that's it. We had a few hours that were good uh, a couple weeks ago because I got out there and did one of my constellation observations. That's good. We only got one left. All right. The elusive sky unicorn. Ah, Monoceros. Yeah. That's a tough one. It is. I, every time I go out there, I'm like, yep, there's the dark void where Monoceros should be. <laughs> Camelopardalis pardalis is really hard to track down i i had a i had a hard time finding it in the planetarium where i used to work so yes oh. despite the fact that it's circumpolar it's really hard to find all right our image just finished let me uh because i peeked in there so let me go back to the uh, acp screen so it looks like we have stars are we ready Yep. Here we go. One and a two. Dum 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 dum. Wow. And by the way, oh, I don't. Wow. The, but the same story, you know. Yeah. They, you have to catch. Yeah, that's why they don't like checks. Wow. We interviewed somebody. Said, "Are you going to see if you want to check it?" Otherwise, I said, "Forget it." We like the person, and we just keep it there. So, let us see. Okay, we're going to mute everyone. That doesn't sound like it's uh, related to what we're looking at. So I want to mention, uh, not only is this the first time we've looked at this during an online viewing session, I believe this is the first time we've ever looked at it, period, with the remote telescope. I don't believe we've ever imaged this target before. And I wasn't sure how the planetary nebula would turn out, but it looks pretty darn good. You can really, really see it there. So let me tell you about M46 and the planetary nebula. So M46 has about 150 stars ranging from 10th to 13th magnitude. And the total stars in the cluster is estimated to be at least 500. Because I bet we could easily count uh, more than 150 stars in this circular region. Because it's a very circular uh, 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 cluster. Its total combined mass is 453 solar masses, which seems low to me. But I guess many of those stars are dwarfs. They're little tiny red dwarfs that don't weigh much of anything. The cluster is approximately 251.2 million years old. And the brightest surviving stars are spectral type A0, which are 100 times more luminous than the sun. And we use the uh, not necessarily brightest, but the most massive surviving stars to help us date the cluster. I could go into more details on that later if you really, really want me to, but uh, yeah, we do get a pretty solid age estimate of roughly 250 million years for this cluster. Its true diameter, if its distance is about 5,000 light years, is 37.8 light years, which again is spherical. So it doesn't matter if you go from roughly the center to here or the center to here, because it's very, very round. Uh, the cluster appears larger in infrared light, suggesting mass segregation with faint stars migrating in a tidal tail to the south and west, likely due to a uh, past interaction with perhaps another star or group of stars or dust and gas, because stars in a cluster don't remain in the cluster forever. The really massive stars like, you know, type O's and type B's, uh, they die. Uh, because their lives are so short. But the more the, the 
less massive stars, say those like the sun or even smaller like red dwarfs, they eventually do leave the cluster. I mean, yes, it's gravitationally bound, but only only weakly so. So the cluster can pass through uh, dust clouds like the Pleiades are doing and lose members or alien stars you know, those that don't lie in the cluster can help rip other stars away. So over time, these clusters do dissipate. So the sun, for example, was once part of an open cluster. And we even have a couple of candidates out there for st uh, stars the sun may have been in the same cluster with because they have a very similar chemical composition. And then we'll talk about the planetary nebula here, NGC 2438. Deep images of this nebula reveal it to be a multi-shell planetary nebula and began forming about 8,500 years ago. Now, besides the distance differences, uh, the radial velocities are very different. You know, the, the speed they travel about through the galaxy. Uh, the radial velocity is 77 kilometers per second uh, versus 41 kilometers per second for M46. So the nebula is traveling a lot faster, not quite twice as fast, but a lot faster than M46. So if they have very different speeds, they can't have a common origin. And plus, uh, stars to reach the stage of a planetary nebula usually require billions of years to form. So this cluster is only about 250 million years old. So it's not really old enough to have a planetary nebula this evolved. But with that said, you can't see it in the picture. It does contain a proto planetary nebula, which has a bipolar shape, and it's called the Calabash Nebula. And it's actually somewhere on either side of the nebula. I can't quite tell in the picture here, but you can't see it anyway. But in deeper images, you can. So there, there is a protoplanetary nebula, but uh, uh, this is definitely not part of the cluster. So there we go. For the first time ever, M46. Plus a nice planetary nebula. And visually, it looks really cool through a telescope, too, if, if any of you have ever observed it before. Any other comments or questions about the cluster before we move on? What's the angular field of view of a 20 inch? Oh, that's a good question. It's about uh, it's about 37 arc minutes square. While the Takahashi is four degrees, almost four degrees. All right, so let's go to our last deep sky target. We're right on time here. It looks like we're right on schedule. But again, we're doing a bonus object, so we'll probably go a little over tonight. That's why we call it a bonus object. So our next target is IC434. And let's see. I think I'm going to do, um, we, uh, again, we've never done this one before, but I've been kind of thinking about it. With the moon, I think we're going to try hydrogen alpha. And let's just stick with five minutes. And off we go. So you can see it's uh, getting ready. Let's see if we can see the telescope <clears throat> slew. Excuse me there. So M46 didn't quite reach the altitude that I thought, but it looks pretty good. Probably why it was a little, it looked a little blurry, but it is kind of low and the scene's like rotten. So that means it's really bad toward the, uh, closer to the horizon. It should be moving by now, but I'm not really sure. But let let me just hit reload and, because it, it does, we're, we're using DSL out there and it's not the fastest DSL ever. So sometimes it gets hung up, but there we go. We are moving now. And uh, this target is uh, pretty high in Gemini. Hey, that rhymes. And uh, so, yeah, that looks about right. All righty. 
So yes, indeed, our next target oops, is IC443, the Jellyfish Nebula. And again, this is the first time we've ever done this during an online viewing session. But another one of our members, uh, Mohammed Zafar, who I think is joining us tonight, he did take a few images of this that, that I did check out just to see how it roughly looks. But we've never done a hydrogen alpha image of this target before. So that's new. So IC443 is also cataloged as Sharpless 248. And of course it has many other designations because it is a kind of well-known object. And uh, just FYI, the, the, the Sharpless catalog is a list of 313 nebulous objects, like what we call H2 regions com composed of hydrogen, uh, molecules of hydrogen. It's mainly supernova remnants, but there are some planetary nebulae. In this case, we're looking at a supernova remnant, and it was compiled by Stuart Sharpless in 1959. The nebula, this nebula, was discovered on September 25th, 1892, by the German astronomer Max Wolf. According to the Night Sky Observer's Guide, because I've never observed this thing visually, uh, its visible extent, which does require an O3 filter to see, is uh, 30 arc minutes by 15 arc minutes. Again, for comparison, the full moon is 30 arc minutes. So uh, the long axis of this thing is about the diameter of the full moon. And the entry that was in the Night Sky Observer's Guide was only for a either 12 or 14 inch telescope. So it sounds like you need a decent telescope with a filter to even see this thing. Uh, visually, um, it mainly has a, a uh, irregular boomerang shape that's elongated uh, northwest to southeast. There are four faint stars embedded within, and the brightest is on the northeast edge, and the nebula fades to the southwest. Here's its rough position in the constellation Gemini, so it's right near the foot of Castor. So this is one of the twins, Castor, here. And this is basically his foot right near Orion's club. So that's the general view. Here's up close with Star Atlas. So it's located about uh, one half degree east northeast of Propus, which is right kind of on the tippy toe of Castor. So you can see it's right nearby there. So it's technically not hard to star hop to. Or you can say it's uh, one and a half degrees west of uh, Tagit posterior mu geminorum, which is right here. So it may be difficult to find, but it's not difficult to get to this area of the sky because you have easy stars to star hop if you choose to do it the old school way and not cheat and use go to. <laughs> All right, back to the uh, ACP here. So again, we're looking toward the zenith, so, so, so the scene looks a lot better. And we're well on our way in our exposure. Let's check back. So Gemini is here. And the telescope is currently looking right about there. You can see the two stars and the foot. So we're looking right about there. And I. Again, we've never done this one, and I didn't have time to kind of rehearse, so I'm not sure how the framing is going to look. That'll be curious. So I, ho I hope you guys like to walk on the wild side. So we're about halfway there. We'll, we'll check back. It's nice to see everybody there. Not, of course, not everybody is sharing their video, but that, that's okay. It sounds like we're using a radio telescope. Do we make contact? Do, do, we, do we detect signals from Vega? I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute that to find out who's. I, I, I don't. I can't tell who's making the the background noise there. But if you do have any comments uh, or questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Hey, Richard, what's your wallpaper there? 
Oh, that's uh, um, uh, the tarantula nebula from the Webb telescope. Oh, sweet. Yeah, six star, six point star there. This is my only non Zoom background because I lost my others because I had to uninstall Zoom and reinstall it because it kept crashing every time I share my screen. And if you haven't noticed, I've shared my screen like a lot tonight. So I had to make sure yeah. I got that working again. Oh, my God. But I lost all my backgrounds. Um, so this, this is the one I installed for our guest speaker uh, at the January meeting. By the way, if you did not see our January meeting, you can find it on YouTube. And it was a great talk by Dr. Kelly Lepo or Lepo uh, from the Space Telescope Science Institute, who talked about uh, Webb's first year of science, basically. So I encourage you to look for that on our YouTube channel. You can find the YouTube logo on pretty much every page of our website that, that, that that'll take you there. All right, we're almost done there. Oops, wrong one. So let me go back to uh, the browser. And uh, we're four seconds past for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why it does that. That's always funny. All right. The suspense is killing me because I don't know exactly what this is going to look like. So it just centers the bright portion. That's what it did for Muhammad and Visible Light. So next time we'll come up with a custom coordinates to maybe frame the whole thing a little better. Because I think we can just barely fit the whole thing on the chip. All right. Are we ready? Let's go. Everyone can go ahead and unmute themselves for the oohs and ahs. Here we go. I'm just as curious as you, because I'm not sure what this looks like in H alpha. At least with our scope. Super. Oh, wow. Awesome. Oh, interesting. There it is. Sweet. Whoa. <laughs> so it does have a very nice filamentary structure. Yeah. Next year, or maybe the year after, when we do this again with no moon, maybe we'll try it in visible light. There we go. Okay, so a few facts and figures at 5,000 light years or 1,500 parsecs. Uh, its true physical size is roughly 70 light years. Uh, the uh, formation uh, time is uncertain, but rain, but Range estimates online go from anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000 years ago. It's probably more toward the five-digit figure. And it does consist of two connected subshells. Maybe we can't quite tell that in the image here, but it, it, I'm just telling you it does. So again, this is a supernova remnant, the remains of a star that exploded. And in this case, it did create a neutron star. I could give you the uh, catalog number of the neutron star, but you can find it online. It's rather long. So that does tell us this was, in fact, a type 2 supernova remnant, which is a single massive star that undergoes core collapse. The outer layers uh, implode and rebound in a supernova explosion. So this is the remains of a single star that basically blew itself up. And the neutron star is moving away from the region at a staggering 800,000 kilometers per hour. Because many supernovae, for reasons we don't quite understand, are like cannons. They basically shoot out their neutron stars at high velocity. And we have found many high velocity pulsars or neutron stars in space. Oh. Uh, both, both the Chandra and the XMM Newton observatories uh, in 2001, identified a uh, Plarian Nebula, which is uh, a kind of roughly new designation. It did come out in the 1970s, though, uh, which is also a Pulsar Wind Nebula, uh, close to the remnant Southern Rim, where we find the Pulsar, because it's in the process of leaving the supernova remnant. So um, to kind of explain a Pulsar Wind Nebula, just look for uh, real movies, like, you know, time-lapse movies of the more famous crab pulsar 
in the Crab Nebula, and you can get a sense of what the Pulsar Wind Nebula is like because you can see it radiate away from the Pulsar in the Crab Nebula. But that supernova remnant is much younger than this one. So one of the best studied uh, cases of supernova remnants, or this is one of the best uh, studied cases of supernova remnants that actually interact with surrounding molecular clouds. So you can see in deep images of the region that last you know, tens of hours uh, does reveal other nebulosity in this region. There's an, another H2 region or a emission nebula, uh, several young stars that are associated with uh, the Gemini OB1 association, which is like a cluster, but not bound by gravity. And an even older supernova remnant that goes back to 100,000 years. That's basically lost kind of around uh, near this one here. So there's a lot going on in this region of Gemini, which, which is no surprise considering we're looking uh, right in the Milky Way. So yeah, this is our first time doing this in hydrogen alpha. Somehow I think you can pick up the widths, the, the structure a little better in, in visible light. But with the moon, I thought it would be better to do hydrogen alpha. So that's, that's curious. So you would do several uh, different filters if you were doing this for imaging. Right. Yeah, if you wanted to, you could do several things. You could do like a narrow band with hydrogen alpha, oxygen three or O3 and sulfur two. Or you could do uh, hydrogen alpha for your uh, kind of luminance and do RGB to bring out colors and stars. So there's there's several ways you can image these things and bring out detail. All right, so that is our last object for tonight that we had planned out. But of course we have a special visitor in the sky and it is a pretty good sized comet. Uh, a little too big for the uh, plane wave. So we're going to switch back to the Takahashi. And again, somebody remind me to, to, to change out the focal length and aperture in ACP when we're done. I probably should have done that first. I was just going to remind you to do it, but... <laughs> too late. I moved too fast. I know. I'm, I'm quick. All right. Mm -hmm. They need to come up with a comet naming system like the hurricane naming system because E3 is a terrible name. That's a terrible name. Well, if if ZTF was a person's name, we would call it comet whatever. But yeah, most comets are discovered by automation now and not by comet, you know, human comet hunters. I think ZTF is a, an abbreviation for the it is. telescope that found it, right? Right. So let me give you a little background here while we're switching telescopes. I'll, I'll kind of watch uh, the observatory computer, computer and do this at the same time. So yeah, this is our bonus object for tonight. That's why we're going to go a little past our 11 o'clock end time here. So uh, this comet was discovered with the Zwicky Transit Facility. That's where ZTF comes from. By the astronomers uh, Bryce Bolin and Frank Maskey. I believe I'm saying that right. I probably butchering it a little, on March 2nd, 2002, or 2022, which is why it has the de designation of C-2022. If this was a P instead of a C, that means it would be a periodic comet, but it's not. Uh, we, we believe this thing is making one more lap, or maybe its first lap around the sun, and that's it. So the Zwicky Transit Facility, or ZTF, is a wide field uh, sky astronomical survey using a new camera attached to the 48 inch Samuel Oshin telescope at Palomar Observatory in California. Uh, the ZTF is named after the astronomer Fritz Zwicky, who was the first to postulate the existence of unseen dark matter. And he was uh, known to be a rather cantankerous person. Uh, for example, uh, he called uh, people he didn't like spherical bastards. And when someone asked him why spherical bastards, he said, because no matter how you look at them, they're a bastard. So that's Fritz Zwicky in a nutshell. But boy, was he a gifted astronomer. I think we're done. Yep, we have switched telescopes. So let me go back to the browser so you can see what I'm doing here. 
All right. So uh, let me change this. I, I can't use a, a slash. So I got to use a dash. And if this does not if this does not turn out, I did take an image of this earlier in the week at like four o'clock in the morning with uh, no moon. So if this is really washed out or you just can't do anything, I will show you one of those. Yep, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, let's see. I want to. Uh, uh, so we want to do uh, twelve hours. Forty-three point nine seven nine. Whoop! My keyboard needs to be clean. So make sure I enter that right. Yep, we're looking good there. Let me go to seventy-eight degrees. Declination eight point. One one nine. I don't know how precise that has to be. Uh, let's go ahead and do. Let's go ahead and do five minutes with the luminance filter. We definitely don't want to use H alpha. They don't give off H alpha at all. And uh, oh, wait, wait. Nobody said anything. I got to change the uh, settings and ACP here for the Takahashi. So it does plate solving correctly. All right. Oop. Okay. We're good there. And acquire image. So let's go back to the telescope there because it's really going to slew around this time. I don't, I don't think it'll have to flip around though. I guess we'll find out. So while we're waiting and watching the scope slew, uh, let me tell you a little bit more here. I did prepare a few notes on the comet. It did reach uh, perihelion. It's closest to the sun on January 12th, 2023 at a distance of 1.11 astronomical units, where one AU is about 93 million miles. In this case, uh, that works out 1.11 AU works out to be 103 million miles. Close, closest approach to Earth will be on February 1st, 2023, at a distance of 0 0.28 AU, 26 million miles. So if anyone's wondering, is the comet going to hit Earth? Uh, no, it's going to miss it by 26 million miles. Uh, so in terms of the solar system, not terribly close. It, According to Mike Patton, it is currently visible with the unaided eye from dark sky sites like Arizona Sky Village, maybe not right now because of the moon, but he said he did see it with the naked eye. And of course, uh, for most of us with light polluted skies, uh, break out those binoculars or uh, maybe a wide field telescope, but even larger, uh, longer focal length scopes would, would work, at least for the coma or the head of the comet. Now you can write this down on February 10th and 11th, the comet will pass 1.5 degrees from Mars. And between February 13th and 15th, it'll pass uh, in front of the Hyades cluster. And I should mention, we have an online viewing session on February 11th. So we will try to capture the comet near Mars as well. Mars will look dazzling with the Takahashi, but that should be pretty awesome. Now, you may have heard uh, it has a green color because the media has been referring to it as the green comet, but that's extremely common with comets. And that's caused by diatomic carbon, two molecules of carbon atoms, which are chiefly around the coma, the head of the comet. Uh, it is definitely a long period comet from the Oort cloud, which surrounds the solar system in like a great sphere because it has an orbital period of 50,000 light years. And during this next passage, it may very likely escape the solar system and travel through interstellar space. And the fact that it's traveling near the dippers is a dead giveaway that this thing is from the Oort cloud because comets that come from the Kuiper belt do not do that. They do not go near the Big Dippers. They stay roughly within 30 degrees of the plane of the planets. So this is definitely a comet from the Oort cloud. It could be its first passage into the inner solar system, or maybe it's uh, uh, taken a long time to get there because it, you know, it may have a 50,000 year period, but that's far from uncertain. 
Let's go back, see how we're doing. It looks like we're still doing uh, plate solving. Uh, I don't think it's gonna find a guide star, but that's okay. No, it did. Wow, that's amazing. Cause boy, one half of the image was like washed out. Maybe because we're looking so low. Let's see where the scope ended up. Uh, it's not that low, especially with the Takahashi since it's on top of the big scope there. If I were standing next to the telescope, my head goes about here, and I'm about uh, six foot tall. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a tall telescope. It's big. All right, so we did get a guide star. That's that's amazing. Let's see what the sky looks like while we're waiting for the exposure to start. Oh, waiting waiting and we're capturing photons yay hopefully from the comet so this is polaris here's the bowl of the big dipper which we couldn't see earlier and i believe the comet is somewhere around here i'm not sure specifically where it is is it closer does anyone know is it closer to the big dipper or a little dipper. Maybe one of these dots could be it, but I really don't know. I think it's in the Draco constellation. Okay, so yeah, Draco would be between the dippers. And uh, the head of Draco, I think, is over here. Do you see how it wraps around? I think. The sky and telescope uh, chart has it closer to the little dipper. Okay. That sounds reasonable. So maybe it's about really about three days oh. ago, it was off the end, the south end of the Little Dipper, and ah. it's kind of cutting across it uh, over towards the Big Dipper, but mostly towards Polaris, as I remember. Well, we know it's going to be over here by Mars uh, by February 11th. So it's, it's yeah, it looks like it's roughly going to take this path to the sky. We 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 have a detailed chart in the newsletter that I borrowed from a, a German uh, astronomy organization and, and, and I had to convert it to English, which was no fun. All right, so we are exposing here. I think we'll just go ahead and leave this up here and wait for the suspense to build. I wish I had suspenseful music or like Jeopardy. We could, we could play the music from Jeopardy. Or not. <laughs> Actually, Richard, right now, from what I'm seeing, um, the two end stars in the bowl of the Little Dipper will point right to the uh, comet because it's right. about the same altitude as Polaris. Is it good? Is it good? Yes. You know, in fact, while we're waiting, let me do the end stuff here. Um, so I'll try to cover this uh, quick. Of course, uh, if you're a member of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society or want to join the club and live in this region in red, you can actually uh, uh, pay your dues, pay the uh, remote telescope fee and use the remote telescope yourself as Dominic mentioned earlier. It's 50 bucks a year, just 50 bucks a year to use a commercial remote telescope. Uh, it would cost more than that a day, a day. And for us, it's 50 bucks a year. So our next and last scheduled session is on February 11th. If you want to register now, let me throw uh, that into the chat. So there is I'm the working on that, Richard. Oh, sorry. I already put it in there. I already have that set oh. and ready to go. There is the registration link uh, for February 11th with the cloud date of February 12th. Maybe I'll, I'll have to look at the calendar and see if we can do a bonus session. Sometimes when we do bonus sessions, we just kind of make it up as we go along. So if you kind of maybe like that approach, maybe maybe we'll do that instead. Uh, you can join the online viewing session email list. Um, if you want, you can direct message me in the chat. You know, don't send it out to everyone in the chat, but just to me, your name and email address, 
and I can add you to the uh, online viewing session email list. Uh, or you can uh, use this email address here to be safe or use our contact form. And one of the uh, pop-up menus, uh, there is a um, uh, thing to set that says, I wanna sign up to the online viewing session email list. And of course, here are all the reasons to sign up for the online viewing session email list. Um, be sure to join us for our uh, February general meeting. I put in the wrong link there, but this link will work. Um, you can go to our schedule page and learn more about this presentation by one of our members, Mike Sinclair. He's an award-winning teacher, a fantastic, lively speaker, and I cannot recommend attending this talk enough. So he'll talk about general relativity for the relatively unenlightened. Very clever title. And of course, uh, lastly, here is the uh, link to download the images for tonight's session. Let me, uh, of course, don't click on this now because you'll just uh, get a bad uh, message from our website saying, uh, nope, that, that, that ain't gonna work. But um, if you wanna copy and paste this instead of like typing it down, there you go. But of course, if you're a KS member or on the OVS email list, you have this uh, link in one of the emails I sent you recently. So, uh, but if you uh, found out about us another way, um, there's a link that you can copy and paste uh, to download the images later, including the images of the comet. So let's see how we're doing. Hey, Richard, on the picture you had of the telescope, can you point out where the board was that failed? Uh, sure, I can do that uh, shortly, but uh, here we go. Uh, darn that moon. All right, are we ready? Here's the comet. You can you can see it, but boy, it's uh, I'm surprised the moonlight suffered uh, got or got in the way that much. But eh, oh well. Here we go. Internet, I warned you. The, the internet's a little slow. The anticipation's building. There it is. Ooh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yay! So we we kind of lost we kind of lost the dust tail. Very nice. It, it gets lost in the glare, but but it's passing through this nice little asterism here too. Yeah, what's that? Uh, that's curious. I don't believe that's a cluster, but maybe someone can check the charts and <clears throat> see, see if that's a known cluster or aster. It's probably an asterism, but who knows? So there you go. There's Comet ZTF. Oh, I, I hear someone using Sky Safari. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. All right, so that concludes the uh, first online viewing session of the season for January 28th, 2023. I want to thank everyone for joining us.